and welcome to the Super Size Phys Ed Podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm your host, and I teach kindergarten through fifth grade PE in Fort Myers, Florida. So welcome. Today, it is not just me talking, which is a good thing. I have a guest today, and it is Stephen Buller. Now, he is transitioning into a new role. He's going from high school phys ed to elementary school. And we have a great discussion on um, actually his vacation. So, so I appreciate him taking the time out uh, to talk to me today. We talk about Adventure Ed, which I'm a big fan of, and I want to incorporate more in my class, um, building relationships, and just all sorts of um, PE, I guess, philosophy type stuff. And um, I, you know, I just, again, appreciate him being here today. So take a listen, and here we go. All right, so here I am with Stephen Buller. How are you today? Good. How about yourself? I'm great. It's uh, great to talk to you again. I, I, I appreciate you uh, um, on your vacation, um, giving some time here for the podcast. Uh, where are you at right now? Um, at the northern part of Duck in the Outer Banks in North Carolina. That's awesome. W- what are you doing out there? Just, um, just relaxing? It's like a family vacation. My dad wanted the get that tradition back so he kind of invited me my brother my wife and immediate family and we're down here kind of enjoying the company and uh being about 200 yards from the beaches yeah that's great (laughs) yeah it's amazing it's an amazing place and uh yeah it's good that you get to you know time to relax with the family so where are you normally teaching where where do you where do you live and uh if you give us a quick you know couple minute bio on 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 who steven bowler is Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, so I've predominantly been an urban educator. I've been located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I've specifically taught in South Philadelphia for the last four years. Before that, I've had some experiences in the South Bronx of New York City. Um, I went to Teachers College at Columbia for physical education and Westchester University of Pennsylvania for kinesiology with a health and PE focus. And for the most part, I've been just kind of exploring the realm of teaching and trying to understand my art of how I teach and my perspectives. Um, Other than that, I'm kind of one of those really relaxed, open, quirky, try to be funny type of uh, individuals that went the PE to see how I can make it different. Yeah, I love it. How long have you been at the uh, your current school? Uh, four years. I actually left. Uh, so this was my last year. Okay. Um, I accepted a position within the district of school or the school district of Philadelphia. Um, I was at a charter school called Universal Alden Reed Charter High School. Um, I decided in part for the transition because I think the school district might be a little bit more stable than the charter environment in Philly. Mm -hmm. Um, Just with a lot of the focus seems to be shifting towards funding public ed and kind of being Um, Mm anti-charter. And I was kind of interested in changing the dynamics. So when most of them were elementary positions, which personally I find to be my weak area, I was kind of interested in making that switch to strengthen my overall overall repertoire of teaching. Love it. That's so you haven't done it yet. Like was it K through five or K through four? It's a K through eight school. I think okay. I'll be responsible for one through four, but that hasn't been confirmed yet. Gotcha. That's awesome that you um, you know a lot of people just go to their strengths and you want to be the you know go into the other realm where you're kind of working on your you know, I don't say weaknesses, but your other, you know, not so, not so much strengths. And, uh, you know, I love that. I think that's, that's great that you want to expand into other realms. Yeah. uh, Yeah. I think it just makes sense if you want to kind of have an impact or have a little bit more say or influence, you should be able to teach literally K through 12. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, it's, uh, um, that's a move I, I definitely want to make in the near future, um, possibly to middle school. Um, I, I've been K-5 for, for, for eight years, 
And uh, it's nice having my own children, though, at my school. So I might, I might wait till they get a little older, then, uh, then transition. So, um, well, I mean, I know you're going to be moving to different grade levels and things, but I, I don't get a chance to talk to that many high school teachers, honestly, like um, phys ed teachers. So can you talk about your, like, your space? Let, let's just go to, like, I guess, like last year. Your physical, your physical space, maybe average class size, minutes per class. Um, just kind of describe your, your classroom environment. So I'll give you the uh, full synopsis of my four years at this, what okay. I will refer to as some of my favorite times of teaching, but also some of the most frustrating and annoying times where you don't necessarily want to continue teaching. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. Um, so the first year I got there, it was a stereotypical inner city high school environment. And just to paint the picture, um, from my understanding, from what students relayed to me and some of the opinions of administrators and teachers, it was essentially glorified recess with a little bit of extra flair. We'll say that way. Uh, we'll say it that way. But, um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> do. Um, the actual facilities, we had a large gym and a small gym. The large gym was actually quite nice. The school was rebuilt so the school prior used to be referred to as the prison on the hill um it had a very dark reputation for violence and other things involving the local neighborhood um to provide a little bit more in depth uh the neighborhood i was in had a lot of not necessarily gang but like street beefs click oriented beefs so sometimes the violence would spill over into the school so, and I guess in like the middle, like 2005, and I think they finished the construction around 2009, they tore down the old school, rebuilt this new one. It's a CTE centric school. The school has shown improvements um, over the past now almost nine years of operation total. Um, that school, when it was rebuilt, was overtaken by a charter hmm. as part of a... Um, renaissance school in philadelphia the so the facilities were quite nice um they were beyond what i expected when i got there but just because i've seen some of the other high schools in philadelphia that have haven't been updated in decades um so the facilities were quite nice the resources were lacking there really wasn't much so it required us to be very creative or visit home depot a lot and i know between my one of my co-teachers and I, we've spent probably well over 1200 a year just acquiring materials to build stuff. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. So class sizes our first year. It would be really interesting because all the classes were scheduled. We were, there were three teachers. We were responsible for teaching 9th, 10th, and 11th. And we would all teach at the same time. So having the three spaces was nice, but lack of resources, things were very scarce. So we had to try to figure out how to create curriculum that was similar, that would move along, but also utilize equipment efficiently. That was kind of a rough experiment um, between having anywhere from 25 to 40 kids per teacher. So there was a lot of downtime. We had to make modifications. Uh, that year, we were responsible for teaching 89 minutes. Wow, yeah. It's, that's, that's a long, that's a big chunk right there. What, what, what did that look like? So at that point, they kind of wanted us to mimic the exact environment within the classroom. So it would have to come in as a do now. We had projectors, sound systems. So each class would have their own do now, an essential anticipatory set. There'd be like a discussion piece, and then it'd go into direct instruction, which was supposed to be my piece. Then there was a we piece, which was cooperative practice. And then the final piece, which was supposed to be independent practice. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't heard anticipatory set in a long time. So you kind of got, <laughs> but yeah, I remember all that. <laughs> so it was literally almost scripted or they were trying to make you teach in a scripted manner. Uh, the one nice thing was, is me being a young person you know 25 first gig coming out of grad school I'm like 
this isn't going to fly. And then with my co-partner and I, we kind of constructed our own idea how we were going to make the school morph around what we wanted to do. So we kind of came up with this whole proposal of switching uh, gym to Ken. So we rebranded within the next six months after we kind of went through their process of changing what gym was to kinesiology, which is kind of like the umbrella term for movement, essentially human movements and how we are humans and how we move. Right. Wow. So we had to rebrand ourselves to even get equipment kind of respect and kind of change the dynamics, which were moving in the right way. And then the next year came the third teacher we had, she ended up, leaving the school last minute right before the year began. And we kind of made the self-punishing or masochist decision to tell them not to hire a third person. We'll just handle it and make modifications as we go. So then our classes on A days went from 25 to 30 a person to starting off first block with 100 and 10 between two teachers and no equipment. Oh my goodness. (laughs) How'd you do that? We still don't know. (laughs) (laughs) It it worked. We had some really great lessons, but then there were some not so good lessons. It was kind of a learning curve. There were days that we had great stuff. There were days that we had really horrible stuff. Um, The kids were understanding we had a really good rapport with them at that point being a second year there that we didn't have as many behavior issues as in past years, even with a hundred to 130 kids in the gym because our second block would go up to 130 because we would have our um, special or life skills classes combined with freshmen who was the, who were the largest cohort at about 115, 120 for that block. But they also had another 80 to 100 freshmen. So there was like two to 240 freshmen at a school that usually houses like 500 kids. Yeah, that's, I, you know, I, I, I have 130 ish kids, but I have three helper. I have three paras, three coaches. And I don't know how you would do that with just two people. Um, does, does your, uh, did your administration, it sounds like you kind of proposed, Hey, here's what I want to do, or here's what we want to do. And it's, were they receptive of it? It sounds like you you were able to, to do what you, I guess, kind of wanted to do. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, we, we were able to do it. Uh, the main reason behind pushing that way is we already knew who they were looking to hire and we already knew it would be a very similar situation to the previous year where we may not be mixing well. And so at that point, just to have another person that may end up leaving or quitting early, we would be in that same situation that we would be in at the moment. So we just rolled the dice and said, you know what, if we get rid of this teaching position just for this year so that we can modify this because this you need to make modifications and add resources, that was our focus, that we'd be able to move forward and create a more viable program that would last for ninth and 10th grade versus ninth, 10th and 11th. It was kind of one of those, uh, risk reward scenarios. <laughs> it sucks to like take the 11th grades experience away, but we were focused more on just adding health classes, which were basically completely non-existent. Right. So I, I like how you talk about resources. So a lot of times, especially on social media, I'll see people that don't have a lot of resources. And that's, that is a fact. And I'm not advocating for people to spend as much money as you, you have, obviously, but because um, we all have spent some money, although you, you spent quite a bit, it sounds like. What, what did you do to, do to get more equipment or uh, just more resources for your, for your uh, PE program? So one of the things that was helpful is when we went through that process and kind of showcased that we were legitimate teachers as well, they did offer us some resources. So we did get some supplies. They did fill up to 5,000 the one year. We had $5,000 worth of equipment that allowed us to teach a wide variety of activities. Um, 
some of it was just donated. Some stuff was stuff that I just had at home that I brought and was like, Oh, this is perfect. Same thing with, uh, my other teacher friend, Chris, he did the same thing. And we were able to like scrape by with just enough because a lot of the stuff we diverted focus to was just teaching more of a adventure based education concept. So minimal equipment, um, just interacting, trying to use like tarps from Home Depot or like boards and kind of whatever buckets, PVC pipes, um, a very minimalist P. But you sound like you made it work, and I think that's that's amazing. Just um, because I do see other people on social media say, "Well, I don't know how to say it, but you know, I got nothing. What can I do?" It's it's uh, not not necessarily giving up, but you know, there, there's things we can do, and there's things we can you know we can be creative with our resources. It sounds like you you really were, and you really have have been, and uh, you know, I love your attitude towards that. Just like you know, I'm gonna make this work, or we're gonna make this work, and. Uh, I'm sure your students benefited greatly from that. And I'm sure they saw that too. And, and the, the changing of the program. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. It's one of those things that a, I would probably say a majority of us are in is a lack of the monetary resources to bring in equipment. Um, we were lucky enough to kind of skate by. Yeah. But I, I love how you said you advocated for, or, or for PE and basically they saw you more as teachers which um, again I'm going back to social media I, I see that a lot and actually there was a big discussion on Twitter uh, mm-hmm. a, a couple of days ago or whatever um, just and it's the truth we you know sometimes we're looked at as um, I, you know just the specials area just the oh, it's almost like just just break time for the <laughs> for the teachers and that's it or glorified recess or and uh, you know I think the more we can showcase hey we're we're, we're educating these students. We're making them to be better people. We're, we're teaching them different skills. We're asking them questions about strategy and, and just in general, like either overall health and well being. And I think the more we can do that, the more we can, um, you know, show that, Hey, (laughs) we are teachers over here and we, we, you know, we're we're teaching the whole child, not just like math, which I love math, but you know, (laughs) that's, that's my number one subject area to go to, to kind of compare. It's like, all right, math are they teaching in authentic scenarios which i think is the one bonus of phys ed is we teach you how to interact and deal with life like how does how do you react to scenarios and how do you respond do you have self-control so a lot of the stuff we wanted to focus on which kind of helped us was what was missing so within the school we looked at culture wise, what was missing and when in regard to how students react to teachers, to peers, to staff members. And from there we kind of formulated an idea of using predominantly adventure ed education concepts because they were missing a lot of the social skills that we were used to seeing when we grew up, because they've had such a varied experiment or experience from K to the eighth grade levels by the time they got to us at the high school most of the things they should have known they had no idea about because they probably went through the teacher issue with teacher maybe not being there long enough teachers leaving not trying to blame but those are just possibilities um but i think a lot of that focus is just us switching to showing that we actually teach and how to teach and finding what is of most need at whatever school you're at. And that was kind of where we took advantage of that. Awesome. So did I hear you say adventure ed real quick there? Is that what I heard? Yes. Can can you describe that? Because I just started learning about that a little bit. At Shape Tampa, there was an adventure ed uh, class or seminar. And uh, I've heard about it before, but I wasn't sure exactly what it was. And I was like, man, I got to start off my year doing this kind of stuff. So a lot of times we would try to use it throughout the year um so like my understanding and how i would define adventure education is just activities that are challenged by choice but require you to challenge yourself and push yourself beyond what you think you can do um so it's kind of for me it's kind of like a broad area because almost anything can be considered adventure depending on how you do it 
traditionally we would think of it as the outdoor education component, like high ropes course, belaying activities that require you to put faith and trust in others. Um, essentially it's a holistic style of teaching PE. And I think it's very human centered. And I think that's really important and something that education needs to do a little bit better of a job of. Um, so some things that we would do with adventure based concepts were like keys, way key ways of how you communicate, how do you interact, um, responsibility. Um, and that's not just like you're responsible for yourself, but being responsible for others and their safety and well being. Um, I can send you like a video of some things that we did that fall, fell in line with adventure ed, which was like trust falls. Um, one that we called launch pad where we took heavy duty tarps and triple layered them and then had a bunch of pads underneath. And that turned into a challenge by choice activity where students had to literally launch each other as high into the air as they could following <laughs> commands and interacting on their own. So it was kind of like a slow release activity where eventually I was just facilitating versus managing. Right. So they could walk in and kind of encourage each other to push their push beyond their fears. Um, that's kind of terrifying where you're laying on a gym <laughs> floor and you have 20 kids around you and they're launching you 10 to 15 feet in the air. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I need to see that video. If you could, yeah, if you'd send it to me or I'll even link it up in the episode notes of people, if you want anybody to see it, like, uh, that'd, that'd be awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I love the idea of that, of just uh, putting your trust in other people. And it doesn't always have to be, you know, jumping off a cliff or anything. It could be more simple. Um, but you know, I love that idea of the, the students getting to know each other and there's, um, and yeah, my dog's in the background here. Um, the uh, students get to know each other and really start to trust each other and build that, like that community. And I think that's so important um, because if you don't, if you don't know each other, you don't trust each other. It's it it can lead to some pretty disastrous, you know, confrontations if if it's not taken care of. Oh yeah, I've seen plenty of those um, in my days at that school. Um, a lot of that stuff's just based off of street beefs um or block beefs if you will social media stuff it's just people not having trust or respect for each other based on reasons they don't know sometimes which is kind of entertaining but sad at the same time because it's just that bridge that they haven't crossed to maybe understand another person and a lot of times these activities would literally kill that tension within a couple of weeks because they're seeing somebody else on a different side. Um, a lot of these kids put on what, uh, professor Christopher Emden would say is a ice grill. So you have to melt away like an ice grill through how you teach and interact with people and how you show care for others as well as the students themselves. Um, another kind of huge area that we took from adventure-based education was problem solving. So we try to turn as many different activities into challenges that required them to solve the problem as a group. Whereas I'm just giving them a problem and letting them kind of go the course and figure it out on their own while I'm sitting back laughing or adding different questions or keeping the environment kind of fun, relaxed, but slightly competitive. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I think that's great. And again, I want to start off my year with something, uh, again, not super dangerous, but, uh, especially with a kindergarten through fifth grade, but, uh, but, but, but definitely working through different, uh, challenges and things like that. I, I think that would really improve their confidence and just the overall like class culture. Um, I had a girl, I was this, uh, this girl did this to me a fifth grader. Um, she just came up to me and she's like, Coach Carney, she turned around. She goes, "Trust fall," and I'm like, "Oh my gosh!" I'm like, like, and she did it a couple times to me. I'm like, "Okay, I was prepared the second time, but the first time, I'm like, oh, I almost, <laughs> I almost lost her there." Uh, the old but, trust but, fall challenge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm like, "Oh boy!" Uh, so be prepared for uh, you know the fourth graders or whatever. <laughs> They're great. Yeah, I feel like you really have a heart for the students that really, really need it. Uh, would you agree with that? 
I would agree. Um, I mean, they all they all need it. They everybody everybody needs it. But I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. The, I, I'll agree with you. One thing that my partner, which I reference is Chris, he uh, that we taught together there for every year since we were there for the four. You're more than a teacher a lot of times in these contexts, and if you're able to make the connections and you're able to build that trust, show that you care, show that you have a love for the kids, they'll do anything for you. Literally anything. They will make sure that they're behaved for you. If they're doing something in another classroom and you walk by the door and see them, you just point at them and then it just like wave back like, Oh, my bad. You caught me. It's almost like you're morphed into that teaching parental role whether you intend to or not. So a lot of times they're literally looking up to you as that kind of line crossing parent teacher where they're looking for a lot of guidance and they want that. They respect that and appreciate that. So, yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I, every kid deserves, um, our, you know, our, our love and, and kindness and, and, you know, our, uh, just for that, us to listen to them. I mean, they all deserve that. Um, but you know, some of these kids obviously, and, and here at my school too, I mean, a lot of these kids either, you know, from a single parent home or, you know, I, I've had students that are, um, I mean, some students are just living in foster homes, you know, bouncing around and, um, it just, you know, these, these kids need, they need structure, they need guidance and they need love. And, um, you know, it sounds like I, I, I just, I just know the younger kids are going to just, uh, <laughs> just want to tackle you every, every minute. <laughs> you know, it's just, it seems like, um, and I think you're going to love it. Have you ever taught for, uh, like a younger grade? I mean, even like student teaching or anything like the younger group. I did what seems a long time ago. When I was in the South Bronx, I worked with Harlem RBI. They started a new program in the South Bronx called uh, Real Kids. And basically what Harlem RBI did, I think they're now just called Dream. Um, They created after-school programming as well as summer programming where you would be responsible for teaching in a classroom, essentially, based on their curriculum. And then you would teach them the game of baseball or softball, depending on the age, as well as the sex. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's most of my experience. And also literally teaching those same kids at the local elementary school as well during student teaching. So all my legitimate experience that I like to look at has been in the urban setting. I don't really Mm -hmm. count my student teaching experiences from... Westchester because I never really mesh the best with uh, we'll say the suburban kids I don't know whether it was just my experience growing up and not relating to that area or like what it was but for whatever reason I just thrive essentially in urban environments well that leads me to my next question you you're talking about uh well we were talking about maybe a a, a podcast that you might want to start or some kind of idea that you had you want to talk about that and maybe i could even help you <laughs> we can help launch this or at least talk about your your idea because i think it's amazing i think it's it's a, it's a great outlet for what you want to get across to the phys ed community yeah um basically the idea between my buddy chris and i um we want to create a podcast that kind of showcases what actually happens inside urban education, both the positive and negative. So the reality is where we have to deal with kids grieving from a best friend being murdered through a shooting or shootings occurring after school, um, drug oriented stuff. I mean, there's so much crazy stuff that can go on. And sometimes that negative Actually, not sometimes. We all know that majority of the times, the negative will outweigh the positive immediately. Like they say, what? It's for every negative, you need almost seven positive experiences to kind of mitigate that negative. So it's just showcasing the positive things that can happen if you're in it for the right intention and you're showing you're in it, that it does change that dynamic that you can find success and then you'll probably have some of the most fun that you've had teaching. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have thought that from day one at the high school until, 
you know, year two, three, where you start to see the progress and you have a lot of fun because it turns into that phys ed environment that you want. And you see these gross, you see kids smiling when they come to class, they're not pissed off coming to PE or when they see you in the hall and they're screaming out, Hey, Mr. Bowler, or Hey, Mr. Castro. It, it's been nothing but love teaching at the school that I did. It was kind of amazing. That's awesome. I, I love hearing that. And I'd be a first subscriber. So let me know when that, uh, <laughs> when you guys get that going, uh, I, I love to hear about that. Um, you know, again, when I, I think we teach in similar, uh, sort of similar districts, but I think yours sounds a little bit more dangerous. And so they, I, I could tell they really need that, that safety of school and, and my, my kids do too, but, um, it really sounds like, especially at the high school level. Um, cause I don't, again, I don't teach at the high school level. Um, I, I really feel like, you know, I'm sure your students feel that from you and, and uh, your, you know, your teaching partner and uh, just the school. I, I would hope that they feel like it's a safe, loving, caring environment that uh, and maybe not, maybe outside of school is not so safe. So, you know, I'd love to hear about that. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> I would say for a majority of the classes, they do feel respected, cared for um, sometimes. I feel like as a school, we didn't do the best with some um, culture, like school-wide stuff. But I think departmentally, depending which subject area, there were some teachers that were doing phenomenal stuff. Um, I don't know how much right. more you want me to kind of explain. No, it's okay. It's okay. Well, I was going to ask you, you know, because you talked about, um, in a, or at least you remind me of, like, I, I feel like there's there's some big wins and there's some big like there's kind of there's really there's a lot of highs and a lot of lows can you give me a high like a, a big win you had or with a student or um or with a unit you did or something in your school or connection i think the biggest high would have been definitely this past year with a couple different classes having that trust and relationship with the class that I could do some stuff that like the tarp activity that I wasn't able to do in the past because that trust and respect area was, it was there, but we all knew as a whole class, it wasn't quite there yet. So having that opportunity, which I'll send you the video was kind of amazing because it was one of those few times where you had everybody constantly wanting to do it and I, I don't mean just like within my class because i would usually have relatively high participation rates into the mid 90s very rarely did i have anybody sit out or not do anything unless there was a specific reason um but kids would hear about it and then they would just be flooding down to the gym which was always a constant nuance or nuisance in the past but this was like a different thing they wanted to just come see the activity and then leave which was kind of strange where something kind of radiated throughout the building where everybody wanted to do it. <laughs> kind of cool. I, lo I love that. That's uh, I, I just, there's a, there's that part of me that has a, it, in my mind of me laying on one of those and like first day of school and the kids just kind of throwing me off to the side, <laughs> like into the wall or something. Uh, <laughs> I guess if you, if you build that trust though, I, <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, I definitely see the videos of that. I think it'd be awesome. Um, on the flip side, you yeah. said the low. Yeah. Um, I guess there'd be like two. One would be like a personal low with teaching would have been probably with the one cohort my first year there. That's when I kind of put two and two together that they were testing. Like they were driving me nuts. I'm like, why won't anything work with this group? Then finally the one day it just like clicked because one of the kids came up and he he'd be referred to as one of the tough kids. He kind of looked at me. He's like, yo, I'm done playing. The game's over. I'm not messing with you anymore. You're cool. You've been chill. I'm just going to do my work. What do you need me to do? Wow. And once you get him on board, then I'm sure that was everything else fell in line. Yeah. At that point, For the most part. started to kind of grow and expand. And then that, that class actually ended up being like one of my favorites and having a lot of connections because some of the girls ended up playing volleyball and I helped uh, as a volunteer assistant for the team. So it was kind of one of those 
really rough starts, but by the time they left three years later, it was very sad to see them go, and it was a very good bond. Yeah, you, you just reminded me of uh, sort of my, my wife just got back into teach again. She she taught last year. She taught eighth grade um, language arts, and there was a, there was well, it was a few students, but there's one sp- specific particular student that just drove her crazy. I mean, she almost wanted to quit the first couple of weeks she was there, and. But by the end of the year, I mean, this this kid, he would, every morning would just come up to her and, hey, Miss Carney, how you doing? Like, give her hugs. And, and I mean, and, you know, by the end of the year, I mean, they were like, uh, you know, almost cr- crying together that she was, she's going to another school this year. And, uh, you know, just the bond that you, you make, I mean, you don't always see it from day one, but you, you might see it at the end or you might never see it. Or, you know, I had a student um, <laughs> recently, uh, he like Facebook mes- messengered me, um, a couple months ago, like I taught him is my last year in the classroom when I taught for about nine, 10 years in the classroom and, uh, my final year in the classroom, fifth grade. And he decided from, I mean, from open house, when he first came in, he didn't, he didn't like me. Like he didn't want, he wanted, he, I mean, I'm being serious. He wouldn't even say hi to me. And, and I mean, eventually we, you know, we had our ups and downs, you know, we, we got, we got it together a little bit as far as, you know, the rapport, um, but he was he was a tough cookie, and then he again messaged me um, recently and was like, uh, you know, I'm going to firefighter school. Um, thank you so much for everything, and you know, God bless, and, and have a great day. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this I thought this kid hated me, <laughs> you know. And it's it's amazing, um, and it's it was a great feeling too to know that years later, um, you know, I, I guess I did make a difference. <laughs> I didn't realize it. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the most powerful things a lot of teachers don't realize if you're doing it the right way even the kid you don't think you're reaching something probably got through to them whether you're aware of it or not and like Mm -hmm. you said you may never know right so that's kind of the one of the main reasons why i'm very mellow relaxed understanding not very punitive I have like minimal behavior issues just because sometimes, you know, kid might be going through something. They're not going to ever say anything to you unless they feel like they need to, Mm -hmm. that they want to. So I think that's like one of those mindsets that you just have to be there in the moment and be patient and caring. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, I just want to ask you this because I got, I've never taught high school. Um, what's a good management tip? And I know building relationship is probably number one, but I mean, do you have an actual physical, like, you know, blow the whistle, uh, you, you know, clapping. I mean, I don't know what they do in high school. Yeah, music. I, I, what, what would be to get to, to start the class? Like, what do you do to start the class or get kids ready to go? Realistically, nothing in regards to that traditional. Okay. Uh, I mean, I yeah. As, as I kind of built through my procedures, which were kind of minimal, I just asked them to follow three main rules. One was respect everyone and everything. The second was try your hardest as hard as you can or put yourself to. So like that challenge by choice. Mm-hmm. And then the third one was just keep an open mind. So a lot of times I just had to ask them, hey, we're going to meet center circle today or Hey, we're going to meet in this corner. And then that would be, I guess the example would be like the tasker in 31st street corner. Like they knew specific corners of the room, but I didn't have anything specific outside. If there was like a whiteboard available, it would kind of change. I like to keep it very minimal and then just refocus on the respect point because with my experiences so far in the inner city, if you relay that somebody was intentionally disrespecting you, or you felt that way, 9.9 times out of 10, they would immediately apologize and come right back and do exactly what you need. So I didn't have to have anything specific because it was developed into that understanding after three years that they're like, oh, he's the teacher. We just have to do what we're supposed to because he's going to have activities that are going to be fun, engaging, and meaningful. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, and I think you're, you're right. I think just getting to know the kids and just building that rapport, I think they, uh, you know, they, 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 for the most part, they, they want to please you. They want to do good. They want to, if you have that relationship with them. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. Uh, let me give you a few more quick ones if I could. Um, yeah. Awesome. So w- w- what is your big, why? Like I, um, what is your big purpose? Do you feel like in, in, in teaching, like if you were to describe it, you look know, like, why, do, what, what makes you 
get out of bed and go to school in the morning besides the maybe the paycheck <laughs> but you know what wh- what is it that drives you in teaching i honestly think it's just the relationships i think having an understanding of how for me there was that one teacher my senior year that said one sentence outside of school and my entire well all they said was hey i hope you go to college you're really intelligent that kind of like flipped the light on like oh snap people are actually teachers actually pay attention so from what mm-hmm. he did for me by letting me know that as the civics teacher i was like well, maybe i should go in the teaching which happened when i started working with kids uh through my friends program where they it was for kids with autism it was a uh, a soccer development. I think he still runs it from time to time or he does like consulting now. But that was the first time where I, I said to myself, I think I want to teach phys ed. And that's what it kind of moved on and made the most sense to me because that's literally what phys ed is, is building relationships with people as well as your understanding of how you interact and move through the world. What Do you have any favorite books or apps or podcast or anything that you you like to to share with us i mean i love learning from other people like things that they've encountered i am all over um at the moment i've been kind of reading everything from frederick uh nietzsche to sun tzu to laura azarito who was my professor at columbia who she's a physical education researcher essentially Mm -hmm. I love to read the theoretical stuff, the deep thinking, and that sometimes fuels my thought for like how I'll adapt or change for teaching. So for example, yeah, give me an example. I'd love to hear it. Yep. Which I'm still trying to morph this idea because it's, I don't think it's been done, but I want to kind of create a little bit of a curriculum or unit for high school age or middle school age using Sun Tzu's um, the, the Art of War? Yeah. yeah. I want to use the Art of War and many of the concepts in there and teaching how you interact or use that for strategy based in like games. So you're also infusing like classical literature essentially and philosophy into phys ed which would also be like a cultural component. Wow. Still trying to figure <laughs> out how that's going to be pieced together. That would be amazing, though. That would absolutely be amazing. Um, I've read, uh, man, I don't know if I've, I think I actually have read the book a long, long time ago. I know I, I used to really be into the classics, and uh, I, I, I have to go back and reread that then. <laughs> That's amazing. I, and I know we were talking again before um, we started recording about some of the other um, maybe books you like to read, and that, I mean, you kind of touched on it, but like a new age kind of books, is that correct? Uh, the new age one, how propaganda works by, uh, Jason Stanley. So I like to like read anything and everything that kind of just piques my interest. I don't feel that I have to kind of, I, I literally don't read for like pleasure, like a traditional story, mm-hmm. for, like people's perspectives and how they view the world. But I think that's important on how you morph, how you would teach because you see that people view everything differently. I was trying to have as many of those avenues to let students kind of dictate their avenue, if you will. Wow. Yeah. No, I love that that way of thinking. Um, I actually had, had to start forcing myself to read more fiction because I was <laughs> I was reading so much nonfiction that I, I just I needed a uh, kind of a break and I became such a snob. Um, a, a, a nonfiction snob, but, but I love reading people's, uh, especially like biographies and, and, and you, you're right. Like seeing how either be, be right. People, how people thought, or, uh, just some of the amazing things they've done and just, uh, using that to fuel my, either my creativity, um, or just my passion, just being like, wow, if this person can do this, so can I, or, um, maybe I can either take that little snippet, you know, of, of anything. I mean, of every single book I've read in my life, I've taken something out of it. And I just, I love that. So if you teach anywhere else in the world, where would it be and why? That's a phenomenal question. (laughs) It's, it's as open-ended as you want. There you go. Well, to give you the easy answer, um, two locations that I would like to teach 
just based on what's around would be, and I've looked into it, the Outer Banks. Mm. I've always thought it'd be amazing to live and maybe teach by the beach and how you incorporate the local culture and activities that are available that way. Or Vermont. But I think my go-to answer would probably be another country, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, I, I actually talked to somebody last night, and she teaches in Japan um, on, a, on, an, uh, on a base, on a military base. and But she actually lives in uh, Las Vegas, and she's kind of a getting my juices flowing as a teacher. Like, I'm like, wow, she, if she can do it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. We'll see, I guess. <laughs> well, what are some goals you have for this year? Like, I mean, I know you're going to a new school. Like, what are some things you want to start off the, the year with or just some goals, even personal goals, if, you, if you'd like? Any, any goals you have for the rest of the year? I think my main goal would be to help with the re- rebuilding process. Um, the principal from the minimal discussions I've had since being hired is really looking to change the dynamics because it is in another section of Philly, Germantown, which also has its issues just like where I was in South Philly. Um, I think being that component to try to bring in as much as possible. Um, I'm already constructing ideas of going out and buying boards and building like a Gaga court. Um, cause they do actually have outside area that they can use, which I haven't had that ability to use outdoor space since being in the South Bronx, but South Bronx was, you had to be very careful because there were shootings like right off campus. Um, wow. sports, I think I want to try to incorporate more sports, um, maybe develop programming for baseball or basketball or volleyball or whatever is kind of the facilities are able to handle. And I think personally mm-hmm. was that part that I spoke about at the beginning is kind of relearning how to teach the elementary age because I did view that as my area that I was weakest at, even though I worked with youth and did well, I feel like I tend to be better as a facilitating educator where I set up the learning context kind of to more authentic situations versus being more of a command or direct instruction oriented teacher, which sometimes I'm eh, at. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate um, this conversation. You know, like I told you um, again, before we start recording, you know, I love just having conversations with people all over the country and then all over the world. I just, I learned so much about different uh, people's backgrounds and just their, I guess their philosophies. And, mm-hmm. you know, I just, I, I really appreciate you, uh, you know, you giving your time, you know, during your vacation for this. Um, so do you have any final thoughts for the phys ed community? Um, whatever you got, go for it. All right. Um, in all honesty, it's going to be cliche, but I'm going to throw out props to my professor from Teachers College at Columbia, Laura Azarito. I would recommend reading one of her early on articles. I think it was like early 2000s. It's called A Sense of Connection Towards Social Constructivist Physical Education. Um, going to grad school changed my thinking. I don't want to say completely, but it morphed my perception on how PE should be taught and it should be more like social and it should be social constructivism to a certain extent where you're allowing the students to create their own understanding and meaning of how they interact with the world and move through it. Um, sounds great from a theoretical standpoint. It can be done practically, but that's an avenue that, you know, is part of, your art of teaching, how do you do it? You have to figure out what works best for you and if that's even something that you would consider. So in layman's, it's just keep reading, keep learning. All right, everybody, what'd you think? We actually had a uh, a nice goodbye there, but my dog kept barking. So I decided to cut it short on a, a nice note there from Steven. So Again, I appreciate him taking his time out during his vacation, and I just love learning new things. I learned uh, just a bunch from you know just talking to him, and I'll link up all his uh, contact information if anybody wants to reach out, and the clips also, which are amazing, 
um, in the episode notes that we talked about. So take care, uh, check out those notes, check out those videos. It's really cool. So <laughs> have a great day, PE Nation. You guys and girls are awesome. Take care. Here it is, the new beat for you.